everyone for uh, coming to our Tuesday evening study group. Uh, we have a wonderful opportunity to have my dear friend, Dr. Jameson Spencer, on this evening uh, to give us uh, some wonderful information. Uh, Dr. Spencer is the director of the Cranial Facial Pain Center in Idaho, uh, excuse me, of Idaho in Boise and um, also in Denver as well with the Cranial Facial Pain Center. Uh, Jameson is the immediate past president of the American Academy of Cranial Facial Pain. Uh, he's a diplomat of the American Board of Cranial Facial Pain, as well as the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, and actually has a master's in cranial facial pain from Tufts University. Well, I could go on and on about your credentials, uh, Dr. Spencer, <laughs> uh, but it's just, it's so nice to, you know, have known you all these years and, and worked with you and just really looking forward to your presentation this evening. Thank so you, welcome. Rose. Thank you very much, Rose. And as we both know, we were, we were uh, teenagers when we started in this field. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, well, I'll get rolling here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, my presentation is, there we go. All right, so we're going to talk about tonight the, uh, the what I call the new paradigm of bruxism. And um, we'll just we'll just get rolling here. So start off a little bit of a video. sleep apnea event. Uh, this gentleman, though, happens to look a lot like my father, who just passed away this last year at the age of 82. Uh, the reason I bring my dad up is about seven or eight years ago, um, my mother had passed away a few years before that, and my dad decided that he was going to take a road trip down to Utah uh, from Boise, so about a five-hour drive uh, down from from Boise down to Salt Lake City. And he was in his, you know, mid-70s, and uh, us kids thought that was a bad idea for him to be driving down there all that way by himself. And he said, well, the hell with you kids, I do what I want. <laughs> so he gets in his car and heads down to Utah. Uh, he gets about an hour and a half away from home and is feeling a little tired. So he pulls off in a little town there, uh, goes to a gas station, gets a Dr. Pepper, drinks the Dr. Pepper, walks around the car a couple times, gets back in the car, gets back on the freeway. About 10 minutes later, he fell asleep at the wheel and drove off the road, rolling his Buick LeSabre down the road about four different times. And if it wasn't that we lived in a world of cell phones, he would have died on the scene because he had some significant head lacerations and other problems that he most assuredly would have bled out. But there were people on the scene immediately, administered first aid. They life flighted him back to Boise, where he was then in ICU for about a week. Uh, at the end of his ICU visit, they kept trying to extubate him. And every time they would try to extubate him, his O2 sats would drop significantly. Finally, a pulmonologist gets involved and uh, decides that this gentleman probably has sleep apnea. They get him in for a sleep study. And my father did what you just saw on your screen there 82 times per hour. So that was our, you know, uh, discovery that he had sleep apnea. Of course, I knew he had sleep apnea, but that was our discovery that he had that. So this is a, a real problem that we're dealing with. I like starting off my lectures with this image from the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study. This, uh, this data published in 
2008 after 18 years of following these patients. In this cohort, it's a group of people that have been diagnosed with sleep apnea, but not treated. Now, obviously, these were not people that were selected to not be treated. That'd be unethical, but these were people that chose not to be treated or maybe started treatment briefly and then gave up. And what we see here is that those with no sleep apnea or HI less than five, um, what this is looking at is mortality or death. So uh, at 18 years, how many people who started the study are now dead? Those with an HI less than five, it's about three or four percent had passed away. Those with mild sleep apnea, that's about double. Those with moderate sleep apnea, aged by 15 to 30, about 15% of them had passed away. But look at that number for HI of greater than 30. Those with severe sleep apnea, over 40% of those patients who started the study 18 years earlier, now dead. And that is a shocking statistic uh, and something that, that really should bring this home, that there are people dying uh, directly related to their sleep apnea, and that's with an AHI greater than 30. My father's was 82. And these people are all around. These are the people that are showing up each day in your dental office that you are treating uh, for their dental needs. These are people in our community. We can't really just go around and look at a person and say if they have sleep apnea or not, as I'll kind of show in my presentation here. These are people that work for you and their spouses. A previous office manager of mine, her brother-in-law, died at 45 directly related to his untreated sleep apnea, leaving his wife and five children. Didn't have to happen. And most importantly, this is you to be there for your children. Um, if you on the phone here tonight have sleep apnea, maybe you've been tested, maybe you haven't. Um, I beg you to learn more about this for yourself, for your own sake, for your own kids. So let's jump in here, some definitions. Most of you are pretty familiar with all this stuff, so I'll be going very quickly. Uh, but apnea is stopping breathing for 10 seconds. A hypopnea is basically shallow breathing. The index is how many events happen per hour. So normal is considered less than five events per hour in an adult. In a child, it's 1.5 events or more per hour is considered abnormal in a child. Mild, 516, moderate, 16 to 30, and severe is over 30. Again, I said my dad's HI was, 30, it was uh, 82. And does story of sleep apnea affect the bed partner sleep? So we have these people having sleep apnea. Uh, you know, is the person sleeping next to them being affected? Well, they did a great study back in 99 at Mayo Clinic where they took 10 married couples, one of whom, the, the man in the couple, was uh, undergoing a PSG for suspected OSA. And they tested the husband and the wife there in the same bed on the same night. If the man, it just happened to be that it was all men that were being uh, tested for sleep apnea, if the man happened to have sleep apnea halfway through the night, they would wake him up, put him on CPAP, and then study them the rest of the night, so a split night study. What they found in that study was that once they put the person on CPAP, that elimination of snoring improved the quality of their bed partner's sleep. Now, these are people that have been sleeping with each other for years. They've been habitually exposed to the snoring and OSA. And even though that was the case, by stopping that snoring and sleep apnea in the husband, the spouse's sleep was improved. Saying they're assuming that eight hours were spent in bed for sleep, a 13% improvement in sleep efficiency translates to an additional 62 minutes of sleep per night for the spouse of the snorer with OSA. An hour. You know, think of how many of you on the phone right now, you're sleeping next to somebody who's snoring. How many of you would just about kill for an extra hour of sleep a night? It's, it's amazing. Uh, who's a real person having sleep at? to an apnea again. Now, when this next apnea ends, I want you to watch his abdomen.
Okay, watch this. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? I would propose to you that this is about the most exercise this guy gets all day long. And uh, <laughs> this is why some people will actually die in their sleep. They'll have a heart attack. That's a lot of work that that gentleman's going through. He holds his breath for, you know, almost a minute and then has these big abdominal contractions and whatnot as he's trying to breathe, these spasms. Um, I'm sure that he cannot, you know, notice he's on his side. Imagine if he was sleeping on his back, but I bet he can't even sleep on his back because his brain isn't stupid enough to allow him to sleep on his back because he would literally suffocate to death. And some of the symptoms that we have uh, with sleep apnea, daytime sleepiness, non-restorative sleep, poor memory, things like that. Um, and let me cover a couple specific depression. Uh, you know, interesting that, that and I'll cover this a little bit more at the end. I think a lot of people are being diagnosed with depression when it's actually sleep apnea and they're just being misdiagnosed. GERD. We just saw this gentleman on the last slide with his big abdominal contractions there. He's also creating a negative pressure in his chest. Do you think that that might pull the, the contents of his stomach up into his esophagus? His, his esophagus? Obviously, yes. And those people will present to the doctor, say they have heartburn, problems like that, and of course they are then put on drugs. They're put on drugs that will reduce the acid content of their stomach. Well, is that what they need? Or do they need an actual diagnosis of what's going on? Bruxism, which we'll talk about in a second here, are some of the things that we are now connecting as dentists that are affecting us every day. Here me, I had a sleep study. I've had multiple home sleep tests and then decided I should have a the real deal. Uh, so I've had a full sleep study and indeed have mild sleep apps. Well, how about in kids? Let's watch a child grab sleep apps. That one's really disturbing, isn't it? Uh, the big guy, probably you're just, you know, you laughed at my joke about that's the most exercise he ever gets. But now we see a little kid, there's nothing funny about that. Uh, it's, it's terrible that a child would have sleep apnea like this. But these kids are being missed. They're being misdiagnosed with other things. Uh, for example, some of the things that, that we will see in children that will lead us to understand that they have sleep apnea is snoring. And bruxism. As a matter of fact, I'd like you to make a note that if you see a child in your practice that has evidence of bruxism and mom says that that kid snores, they've got sleep apnea. So prove it otherwise. Uh, the, the odds of them having sleep apnea are huge. So remember that. Snoring and bruxism pretty much equals sleep apnea. Let's talk about ADHD for a second. I imagine there's uh, some of you out there who have little kids. Well, what happens when you keep a child up way past their bedtime? three, four, five, six-year-olds. They get hyper, don't they? They get crazy. Uh, they, they get inconsolable. They get ornery. They get you know, whiny, all this stuff. They don't get more and more sedate like we adults do. Okay? But then they take these kids and they diagnose them with ADHD. And how do our physician colleagues treat ADHD? With Ritalin, with Adderall. Street name, speed. So they put these kids on speed. All right. Well, is it because they had a speed deficiency? Is that why these kids are, are hyperactive? And then we say, oh, it's a, it's a paradoxical effect. We're giving them speed uh, because then it paradoxically calms them down. I don't think it's a paradox at all. I think what's going on is in some of these kids, they are tired because they have sleep apnea. They're tired, so they act hyper. And then when they are given speed, they act normal. Okay, you follow me there? Now, am I saying, and am I saying anywhere in this lecture, that all of anything is related?
related to sleep apnea. I am not. What I am saying is before my kid gets put on speed, he's getting a sleep study. That's what I'm saying. Okay? Before my wife goes on Prozac, she's getting a sleep study before she does. Before I start taking Nexium, I'm getting a sleep study. Okay? I, I think very strongly that sleep apnea is a, is a disease, if you will, that, man, it's one of the best diseases to have if you got to have something because we can treat it mechanically. No drugs, typically not surgery, mechanically. It's fantastic. And you see the other problems here, and aneurysa, other problems like that. But remember, take-home message, snoring and bruxism, that means sleep apnea. And again, I put my money where my mouth is there. My own child has had a sleep study. That's Jefferson. Uh, he was having some problems in school and stuff like that. And we got him in. He had sleep apnea, got us talk of that. He's now a different little boy. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about parafunction, though. And when we think of parafunction as dentists, we immediately think of bruxism and wearing down the teeth and using the teeth for things that they aren't really meant to be used. And parafunction might lead to various things, right? TMJ disorders, castellitis. Castellitis is an inflammation of the joint castle. If we're putting a bunch of pressure on our joints from clenching and grinding the teeth, we could cause an inflammation of the joint capsule, and that's called castellitis. We could cause internal derangements if we do this long and hard enough. We can have disc displacement, disc displacement with reduction. That can lead to disc displacement without reduction, and that can even lead to degenerative joint disease. All of this can be brought on through putting excessive forces on our somatonaphic system. Myofascial pain dysfunction, if we use these muscles over and over again in ways that they really weren't designed to do, it can cause trigger points in these muscles. It can cause just muscle pain, but then also trigger points. And trigger points can refer pain to other parts of the head and face and neck and teeth. And there will be patients who, unfortunately, will have procedures done to their teeth because they believe they have toothaches and tooth pain, but that pain is actually coming from their muscles and they have myofascial pain dysfunction. All of this could be caused by so-called parafunction. But what if it isn't parafunction after all? And that's what I'm talking about here. It's a new paradigm regarding the etiology of many of these problems. And I call this protective function. What if it's possible that the things that people are doing with their teeth and with their jaw muscles, this, this uh, you know, what we've called parafunction in the past, what if it's possible that some of these people, not all obviously, but some people might be doing these things to help protect themselves help protect their airway. So, for example, a uh, protective function might be this man running away from the woolly mammal, or this man on the bottom trying to defend himself from being beaten to a pole. If any of us on the phone call here were in a similar situation, we would do the move that the guy on the bottom is doing right now. That's called protecting yourself so you don't die. So what I'm going to try to do is connect this so-called parafunction, this dental clenching and grinding, things like that, uh, posturing of the jaw, using those muscles of mastication to the possibility that that is protective in nature to help us with sleep apnea. Reviewing some anatomy really quick, uh, we know that our, our pharyngeal airway is held open by reflexes during the day. But when we go to sleep, this reflex of control can be lost, is lost, and the pharyngeal airway can narrow or even close completely. This is the view that you're looking at every day as a general dentist. And what we ask that you do is look a little bit farther back. So not just focusing on the pearly white things, but look back in that airway and see what you see. Maybe you see a normal airway, and that's great. Maybe you see an obstructed airway. And that should maybe just get you to ask your patient a couple questions. <clears throat> As what's happening in sleep apnea is this airway narrows, the jaw basically falls back. The mandible falls back. Our tongue, the genioglossus, and other genial enough muscles attached to the back of the chin. That's where the genial tuber goes. When that jaw falls back, it can narrow or block the airway. Thus, we can have sleep apnea. So let's talk about some proposed mechanisms of bruxism. Uh, you see the name Levine in, uh, in my slides a lot here. Gilles Levine, he is one of the foremost researchers in the world of bruxism and a great man. If you ever have a chance to uh, hear him lecture, please take advantage of it. But in this study, they were looking at breathing related to what he refers to as rhythmic masturbatory muscle activity. Now, this doesn't mean tooth contact, grinding.
means, stuff like that. So a lot of these, we're talking about using these muscles in mastication. Sometimes there's tooth contact, sometimes there's not. So it's not always about the clenching together or the grinding of the teeth. Sometimes it's just using the muscles. But anyway, in this study, they found that related to these rhythmic mus mastery muscle activity, that there were amplitude changes in respiration 11 times higher when there was an arousal associated with this RMMA. Well, what does that mean? That means that these people were basically breathing 11 times higher or, or more around the event of tooth grinding, of using these muscles of mastication. Well, why would that be? Why would there be a rise in respiration around this so-called bruxism type activity? You know, just think about that. In this study, they were looking at, well, where are these, where are these signals coming from? There's a sequence of events that's happening, and where from the brain are these signals coming from? Well, what they found was that the rhythmic mastery muscle activity and sleep bruxism episodes were under influences of brief and transient activity of the brainstem arousal reticular saying system. The brainstem. What's the brainstem's job? You know what it is. It's to keep us alive. Okay? It's to keep our heart beating, to keep us breathing. Why in the world would the brainstem bother itself with clenching and grinding the teeth using these muscles of mastication? Why would it do that? Okay, you can just think about that too. In this study, they looked at these rhythmic mastery muscle activity events and sleep position. And what they found was that these events occurred more when the person was on their back versus on their side. Why in the world would these bruxism-esque events happen more on your back than on your side? Hmm, interesting. Well, is there a relationship to bruxism and sleep apnea? My friend Jeff Okeson, back when I was still in high school, he did this study in 1986. And he found that there was a correlation between the clench index and the apnea plus hypopnea index. People who had higher apnea plus hypopnea index, or AHIs, tended to clench more. Interesting. He found also that both of these things were better when the person slept on their side. Huh. So there's a pearl for you. If you want to help your patients who are suffering with clenching and, and grinding of their teeth, have them sleep on their side. Now, again, why would that help? Would that help because sleeping on your side improves canine guidance? Would it help because sleeping on your side reduces second molar interferences? Uh, I don't think so. So maybe there's something to do with the airway. So why do people grind and clench their teeth? What'd you, what were you taught in dental school? Go ahead, say it out loud. Okay, you just said stress. Okay, you're all muted, but I know you all said stress. <laughs> okay, here's a guy who's got an espresso concentrate going straight into his veins, he's paying his bills and stuff like that. Here's a guy who's got a big headache. Here's one of your office managers after you've done something stupid for the hundredth time. And here's a dog who I think we can all know that he is very stressed. But have any of you ever choked? I bet if there's anyone on the call right now who has, or knows someone who has, but that's a very, very stressful experience. Okay, probably most of us can't think of anything more stressful than choking on something. If you've ever been under the water and you weren't sure you were going to make it to the top, that would be exceedingly stressful. If your wife's ever tried to kill you with a plastic bag like mine has a few times, that's a very stressful situation. So I wonder if some of this clenching and grinding, maybe it is due to stress. But it's the stress of suffocating to death, not necessarily some of the emotional stress that we've attributed to in the past. And what about in kids? I showed the, uh, the kid there earlier having sleep apnea. We've never blamed that on stress, have we? We blamed it on all sorts of other stuff, the mixed dentition, uh, their growth and development, it's all sorts of other stuff. And the main thing is, you know what, kids, they just do. They just do. And the other thing is, they'll grow out of it. You know, they'll just grow out of it. I'm not so sure that's true. I think some kids do indeed grow out of it. I think tonsillar tissue in some people does shrink after age about 8, 9, 10. And it will shrink down and maybe they'll change. I think some kids grow out of it facially. Their, their face catches up. Their mid-face and lower face catches up with the rest of their head. And they get a nice airway and maybe they do grow out of it. But I think some don't. And I think the ones who don't grow out of it are the ones that you see when they start college and move to your area and they're 20 years old, and they've got a bunch of evidence of wear that was watched by 
their general dentist up until they left home, and now you're the one picking it up in their 20s. That didn't happen overnight. That took a while. And I think those people have probably been punching right in their teeth since they were kids, and they indeed did not grow out of it. Now, in some kids, it may be stress. For example, this kid, he's got to check his E-Trade account all the time. He is probably a little stressed with the fluctuations of the market, but most kids, I don't think it's stressed. Mm -hmm. And looking at some of the research on kids, in this study they were looking at um, kids with sleep apnea. This was an apnea index of five or higher, which is really bad sleep apnea in a child. And what they found was that snoring was the most frequently observed finding. 100%, all of the kids with sleep apnea had snoring. Mouth breathing was the most frequently observed dental finding. In this study, they found that all the kids with severe sleep apnea had snoring and bruxism. Snoring and bruxism when they had the severe sleep apnea. So again, remember that. If a kid snores and has evidence of bruxism, in my opinion, that kid's got sleep apnea. They should be tested out and made sure. They should be tested in a sleep lab to see if they have sleep apnea or not. By a sleep lab who knows what they're doing. Okay, not all sleep labs are created equal when it comes to kids and uh, uh, Home sleep testing, in my opinion, is not for kids. Uh, there are, there is one. Uh, the Knox T3 has been FDA approved for children, but you know what? At this at this stage of the game, that's not being used in my kid. My kid's going to get a real sleep study to see exactly what's going on. So, what if we treat the sleep apnea in kids? The way we treat sleep apnea is we take their tonsils and apnea test. That's that's first line of treatment. Well, if what I'm talking about here is real then theoretically you would see a change in bruxism after treatment of sleep apnea. So in kids, that would mean after tonsillotomy. This study showed just that, that we went from 45% bruxism to about 12% after surgery. So effective treatment for bruxism might actually be breathing. Interestingly, huh? Might just be breathing in and out. So if that's the case, what about CPAP? What about when we put a mask on someone's face and blow air up their nose? We know that that treats sleep apnea. So theoretically, if what I am talking about here is real, then there'd be a correlation between CPAP and bruxism, and it would reduce bruxism. Well, there isn't a heck of a lot of literature on this, uh, but if you talk to sleep technicians, which I get the opportunity to do all the time, they will tell you that what this uh, case study reports we see all the time. Now what that is, is they had a patient who had really bad sleep uh, uh, bruxism and had sleep apnea too. So on the baseline study, they documented all this bruxism events. And then when they put it on CPAP, it says here, most of the breathing abnormalities were eliminated, but there was a complete eradication of the tooth grinding events. Gone. The bruxism was gone. They say, this study suggests that when sleep bruxism is related to apnea hypopnea, successful treatment of these breathing abnormalities may eliminate bruxism during sleep. Wow. Now, is that because blowing air up this guy's nose improved canine guidance? Is it because it eliminated interferences? Is it because it brought him into CR? Is it because it improved his marital stress or his work-related stress? Obviously, I'm being totally facetious and, and an idiot here. No. Blowing air up his nose had nothing to do with any of that stuff. It had to do with his airway. So there's things that we can do to help people use their CPAP, isn't there? We can do things with the masks and stuff like that. All these things I showed on the screen are things that I've done. But I believe now that the best combination therapy is just whatever oil appliance you think is good for the patient and whatever CPAP mask happens to work for that patient. That's, I think, the best way to do it because it's the most affordable for the patient and the easiest for you as the dentist. Now, I'm not saying the EMA and that nasal mask. I'm saying whatever oil appliance and whatever mask works for the patient. Well, what about bite splints? You know, we give people these plastic things or they buy them at the store um, to, you know, treat their bruxism, so to speak. But we as dentists know that we're not treating anything. We're just giving the patient something else to grind on. Giving them a piece of plastic so they can beat up a piece of plastic instead of their teeth. All right? Now, patients don't necessarily understand that. They think that you give them this piece of plastic to stop their grinding. All right? Uh, but that's not true. You know, we're giving them something to let them grind on something else. And that's kind of interesting. That would kind of be like if you had a patient and their problem was banging their head 
right against the wall, you would say, here's a helmet. Here you go, here's a helmet. Okay? And I use that analogy every day with my patients. I say in the past, you know, dentists have given you a piece of plastic to put on your teeth, and that was kind of like they thought your problem was banging your head against the wall, and they gave you a helmet. I said, here you go. You're going to still bang your head against the wall, but at least it's not going to hurt so bad. What I'm trying to do is figure out why are you banging your head against the wall? And maybe in your case, maybe it's related to this sleep apnea problem. Now, we don't know until we get you over to the sleep doc and we uh, figure that out. Maybe in your case, maybe we can figure out why you're banging your head against the wall. Dr. Levine did another study that uh, should keep us all awake at night, pun intended, where he looked at people who have sleep apnea and gave them a maxillary occlusal splint, a flat plane occlusal splint like his taught in dental school all around the world. And what he found with these people with sleep apnea, when they used this maxillary occlusal splint, it made some of them worse. Well, that's a little scary. Uh, some of them, their AHI increased, some of them, their RDI increased, their time with snoring increased with the occlusal splint. And you've all experienced this in one way or another. You've given patients night guards and they've said, hey, doc, I can't wear this thing. I wake up and it's in my hand. I wake up and I've thrown it across the room. I swear this makes me grind more. My wife says it makes me snore. And I've had patients say it makes me feel like I'm choking. Interesting. He goes on to say this open study suggested that use of an occlusal splints associated with the risk of aggravation of respiratory disturbances. It may therefore be relevant for clinicians to question patients about snoring and sleep apnea when recommending an occlusal splint. Wow. Of course, everyone on the phone call already does that, right? You're asking everybody about this, and you always have. No, of course, I'm being facetious again. I'll bet you today in the United States there were 100,000 night guards on the How many of those patients that were fit with night guards today had sleep apnea? And how many of them are going to go to bed tonight and maybe be a little bit worse? Now, I'm not saying that to make us feel bad or to beat ourselves up. I'm just saying we can do better. We can look for a possible reason that the patient's hitting their head against the wall. And by the way, the most wonderful thing on earth would be if all bruxism was related to sleep apnea. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be so awesome. That would mean every time we saw it, every time we would know, boom, oh, you've got sleep apnea, let's treat the sleep apnea, and it's all going to go away. I can tell you from a whole bun bunch of experience, that is not the case. I have tons of patients who we have in oral appliance therapy, they are totally protected. We've had them back in the sleep lab. We know their oral appliance therapy is working for their sleep apnea, and they still grind and clench on those appliances. Okay? So it's not a panacea. Man, I wish it was. That would be so awesome. But unfortunately, there are still some other things out there that can cause people to clench and grind their teeth. Well, what about mandibular advancement? So CPAP works by blowing the airway open. Oral appliances work by keeping the jaw from falling back. So maybe... If we put something in the mouth that kept the jaw from falling back, maybe that would have an effect on breakfast. Well, let's see. Because this is basically just head tilt chin lift, isn't it? We're opening the airway. Here's my airway. Uh, you can see how I went from basically uh, just a normal overjet there, overbite, to basically end to end. And there's a huge change in my airway, a doubling of the size of my airway. Of course, I'm sitting up awake, but nevertheless, I know for a fact that when I do wear my oral appliance, it makes a big difference in how I breathe at night. Well, Dr. Levine looked at that, too. He had a group of people who spent five nights in the sleep lab. Imagine that. You know, most of you haven't spent any nights in the sleep lab. Five nights, these people said. One night, just getting used to it. Another night, as a baseline study, three nights then, one with a mandibular advancement appliance slightly protruded and pronounced protrusion. And then the last night, with, or one of the nights anyway, with a mandibular uh, clusal splint. So, excuse me, a maxillary clusal splint. Flat plane, upper night guard as a control. What they found was that use of the mandibular advancement appliance was associated in a significant reduction in sleep bruxes and motor activity. Significant reduction. The maxillary occlusal splint, no change. In this study, they used actually a boiler light, a temporary appliance. Found the same thing. Remarkable reduction in sleep bruxes and motor activity. This is a temporary appliance that you might be able to use. The silence is it's one that I invented. Don't spend too much time on that, though. And there's lots of different appliances that we can make, it, aren't there? There are tons of things that we can do. And I believe that these things you see on the screen right now are state-of-the-art bruxism treatment. While we're figuring out why is that person punching right in their teeth. This is state-of-the-art. This is where we're at today. So let's talk about...
without screening your patients. So these are some of the med medical risk factors, BMI greater than 30, neck circumference greater than 16, high arch palate, retronathia, or a malampati class 3 or 4. All of these things, the, the malampati is recently, there was a study that said that really didn't matter. Um, we do know that, you know, the fatter and older you are, the more likely you are to sleep apnea. Uh, so all of these things are indeed risk factors, but, you know, this isn't really necessarily all the things I want you to worry about. As a dentist, I think you should have a screening form uh, that you give all of your patients. I mean, everything should locks in the door. But these screening forms, too, the upward sleeping scale, the stop ring, these are looking for fat old men. They just are. So this should just be something to open up a conversation. You shouldn't hang your hat on the patient comes in and they've got a score of nine on the upwards, so therefore they don't have sleep apnea. Or they only got a two on the stop thing, so therefore they don't have sleep apnea. That's below. So this is, if you see you know, anything on this type of a form, you should be asking questions, further questions. And then start thinking as a dentist. Start looking at their teeth. Why? Why would people grind on their front teeth? Why would they do that? Tori. I see way more people with pori than you would think that I should. But again, I, my practice is limited to TMD and sleep. Evidence of gastroesophageal reflux, scalloping on the borders of the tongue. That's the tongue trying to escape out of the mouth. A narrowed airway. All these things are things you should be looking for. Here's one of my patients, cone beam CT. This person comes in for a TMJ problem. Sitting up awake, 1.2 millimeter airway. 1.2 millimeters. To put that in perspective, those little straws that you stir your coffee with, are 2.6 millimeters in diameter. This poor lady, 1.2, sitting up awake. You think it's possible that when she goes to sleep at night that her jaw might fall back a whole millimeter? You know, I think that is possible. Let's talk about a couple of my patients. Here's one, his name's Nacho. He's male, he's 42 years old. His chief complaint is tired and he lacks energy. The doctor says, do you snore, Nacho? He says, well, you know what, I do. And he says, well, Nacho, we better get you a sleep study. So he sends Nacho off for a sleep study because he is a little bit overweight, uh, middle-aged guy. Here's another one of my patients. Her name's Jennifer. She's a uh, female. She's 44 years old. Her chief complaint is she's tired, lacks energy. Her doctor says, well, Jennifer, are you having trouble sleeping? She says, you know what? I am. And he says, here's some Prozac. Okay, so Jennifer gets diagnosed with depression. Huh, why'd that happen? I see that there are a few women on the phone call tonight. This should super piss you off. You should immediately get off this and go post on Facebook that women are being misdiagnosed with depression when they actually possibly have sleep apnea and they could be treated for their sleep apnea. And they're being diagnosed, they're put on medications, and worse than that, they're given a label of being depressed. And this is one of my passions now is to help women not get those labels and think about this with the field of other stuff that we think about too are more women or men diagnosed with start off with depression women right by a lot how about tmj problems women by a ton you know what the correlation is almost 50 percent of the tmj patients that i have that are referred in my practice we refer for sleep studies last year we sent about three or four hundred people who were sent to my office for TMJ problems for sleep studies. Out of those, we had three who did not have sleep apnea. You know what that means? That means I suck at referring people for sleep studies. I should have referred far more. I should have had 100, if I'm doing my job right, who didn't have sleep apnea. Okay, I only have three. So I'm missing a lot of people. Okay. What about fibromyalgia? Way more women, right? What about chronic fatigue syndrome? Is it possible that many of these so-called syndromes might be related to poor sleep? I think it is. And again, am I saying all depression is related to sleep apnea? No, I wish it was. That would be awesome. All I'm saying is, before my wife goes on Prozac, she's getting a sleep study. Here's a couple real patients. This is one of my patients named Becky. She's from Colorado. Uh, look at this woman, and do you immediately think sleep apnea? I don't think you do. I think you think this is the opposite of someone who is supposed to have sleep apnea. She's five foot five, 125 pounds, she's healthy, look at that square jaw, but she has large tora. She snores. This woman snores, which only I would know because only I would ask this, and her husband knows too, but normally she
she would not be asked if she's dead. She has anterior wear on her teeth, and she had bonding, you know, composites, that she kept breaking off. Hmm. Her jaws always pop, she says. She's had a night guard for four years. She gets sent to me for her TMJ follow-up. What did I do? Well, I got a sleep study on her, didn't I? She thought her whole problem was related to stress. Okay? Just like our patients buy into the same stuff that we bought into. I sent her for a sleep study. Yeah, I don't know how many people would have done that. She has an AHI of 24. This woman on the screen right there. AHI of 24. Moderate, almost severe sleep apnea. Here's another one of my patients, 54 years old, also thin. AHI of 11 on her back, 21 in REM sleep, clear up to 36. History of jaw problems. She's had tried CPAP but failed it. Okay, had sleep apnea diagnosed back in 2007 sees me for extreme jaw pain, facial pain. Once we got her sleep apnea treated, that got that. Proper diagnosis is the key to proper treatment, where the mystery is in the history. Here's one of my favorite far sides to prove this point. The hound dog there says, I can't smell a damn thing. Now, how likely is the posse here to find the bad guy they're looking for? Not very likely. They might get lucky. You know, you never know. They might get lucky. But their diagnosis is this dog knows where he's going, so what they're doing is probably not going to lead them to what they want. Now, what I'm going to show you next here is a episode of The Doctors, a TV show that's on in the afternoon, watched by millions of people, and uh, they're going to diagnose a woman with a TMJ problem, and let's see, after my 45 minutes with you here, if you are good enough to get the proper diagnosis. You have a recurring headache, maybe jaw pain, or hear clicking sounds when you take a bite of food. If you do, you may have this word called TMJ. And here to fill us in on a possible solution is cosmetic surgeon Dr. Alex Redkin, as well as Suzanne. And Suzanne suffers from TMJ. Welcome to you both. Anymore. 
so she'll probably have some other issues. But her muscles won't hurt. And in the three or four months when that Botox wears off and she starts to be able to use them again because her brain would like her to breathe, they'll hurt again. And she'll go back for more. And keep going back for more. And that, to me, is very, 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 very sad. So, in conclusion, headaches and TMJ disorders in general may be related to this so-called parafunctional activity. Parafunction may actually be protective in nature. When the etiology of headache and TMD is bruxism related to OSA, treatment of the OSA often results in improvement or elimination of the TMD. Before initiating treatment, there's potential to negatively affect the airway, such as flat plane splints, the NTI, Botox injections, etc., or that is irreversible, surgery, dental reconstruction, stuff like that. Rule out OSA first. How you might do things? Screen your patients for bruxism, snoring, and sleep apnea immediately every patient that walks in the door. Treat your patient maybe with a temporary appliance for their bruxism, for their bruxism. I don't want you treating people for snoring. I don't want you treating people for suspected sleep apnea. You need to wait until they're diagnosed. You need a referral from a physician. So treat them for bruxism. You can do that. You've been doing it before. Now you're just going to do it by the state of the art. Refer those people to a sleep doctor for consideration of a sleep study. That's how I do it. I've referred thousands of people to the sleep doctors for consideration of a sleep study. That's exactly how I say it. I'm a dentist. I think there may be an issue here. I'm not sure. I'd like you to go speak with Dr. Blank, the sleep doctor, and see if maybe you and the sleep doctor think that you might need a sleep study. And then after they get the sleep study, we go from there. Follow up with the patient for creation of a long-term treatment plan and go for it from there. So that is it. That is my lecture. There's my email address. If you have any questions, you want to learn a little bit more about the silent sleep, that's on there too. The Academy of Craniofacial Pain, the Rose mentioned that I'm the past president of, we have several courses uh, going on. Um, also, I'm going to be working with Rose uh, in Denver in October, and you can see me other places too. Uh, but and we do have a, a couple more minutes if you want to um, either raise your hand or type in a question. I can take a couple questions here. Um, I do, and I am expected on a conference call um, that started a while back ago, so I will need to only do that for about five minutes or so. All right, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Spencer, for that great presentation. I, I do see we have a, a question from Andrew. Andrew, if you'd either like to jump on the line or type into the chat box. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Jameson, hi, Andy Cohen. I actually met you out at Sphere when we had our first sleep apnea uh, workshop. Uh, I have a question for you, if if you don't mind. Um, I have a patient that I just saw today, um, eight weeks post-op from when we delivered a mandibular advancement device. For the last eight weeks, he has felt amazing. His wife says he doesn't snore. He feels great, has energy. Um, as part of my protocol, I give all my patients a home sleep study test to make sure that the appliances are working, and his AHI did not change at all. It is still a 37. So, obviously, we're not treating his sleep apnea. Do you have any suggestions? Because the patient says he feels amazing. So, it's, it's not necessarily obvious that you're not treating his sleep apnea, but what are you comparing that AHI lack of decrease to, to his original sleep study or to uh, another home sleep test? His, another, his, he had a home sleep test that was done this past September, okay. and the, the AHI was the exact same. Okay, so you are comparing apples and apples. That's good. Uh, number two, what I want you to do is I want you to go back in that data there and look at a couple other things. Now, do, you, do you know what kind of equipment was used for the home sleep test? Uh, he, I don't know what the one in September was. I used a Care Fusion Knox 3. Okay. Um, and the Knox 3 doesn't have brain waves, is that correct? That, that is correct. Okay. So assuming that his first one also didn't have brain waves, then both of these, we use the term home sleep test with sleep kind of in quotes because we don't know if they slept or not. Correct. So here's what I predict. I would predict that his first sleep study 
showed him to have really bad sleep apnea, I bet he slept a lot less in that study. So probably he has way worse sleep apnea than you think he did, okay. uh, even though he had severe before. So I'll bet you anything you've caused a tremendous improvement in his sleep apnea, and it's difficult to see that on the results. So now what I would do if I were you is strongly, strongly, strongly encourage that gentleman to get into the sleep lab and then go in with them to the sleep lab if this is the first time you've done this, and you will adjust or have the technicians adjust the appliance in the sleep lab to the best position. Okay, okay. what appliance did you use? I use the G2 Somnimit. Awesome. So you'll go in there with your little parts and pieces so that you can adjust that jaw position, and you'll start off, and if in the first hour he has you know, five or ten events, you're going to wake him up gently. You know, I'd suggest you keep the lights off and go in the room. Hey, Mr. Johnson, we're going to adjust his appliance. He spits it out. You go out the hall, crank in the, the additional parts to bring his jaw a millimeter forward, come back in, pop it in, see how he does. Okay. Yeah, find a unit in the sleep lab, and I bet you'll be very pleased with your results. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Can we take one more question? Yeah, great. Dr. Glass, I see you have uh, your hand raised. Oh, Dr. Glass, are you on the line? All right. Um, I think uh, Dr. Glass might uh, be stepped away or, or uh, on mute. Is Oh, I'm sorry. The question is in the chat box. Um, the question is, I have several HST calibration studies with an ARIES unit with greatly improved AHI, but still concernable RDI, 1%. Any thoughts? Yeah, so the, with the AHI and the RDI, so the, the RDI is measured in various ways by the home sleep testing units. Some of them are looking at airflow, and there's a flattening of airflow, and that's how they get the RDI, for those of you who aren't as familiar with this stuff. So AHI, apnea apnea index, I covered that. RDI is AHI plus respiratory effort related arousals or rear rest. okay? So you, you, you wonder, it's like, well, how the hell did they know rear res in a study? Now the ARIES unit does have some brain waves, so theoretically it could come up with some rear res. Uh, the other units that don't have brain waves, they get it completely from airflow. And there's some good studies showing correlation with airflow and rear res. So bottom line, any of these units can report to you an RDI. And that is true the case that, that sometimes you will see a reduction in apneas, a reduction in hypopneas, uh, and maybe a little bit of an escalation of some rear res. And then what is the real, you know, uh, importance of the matter there is, is the patient symptomatic or not? Uh, how are they feeling? And if that correlates with the patient being symptomatic, then I think you got to do a little bit better. Um, again, I am a huge advocate uh, and probably do more in-lab titrations than anybody in the country, and we've taught all of our techs how to adjust those appliances in the lab, and I, I really think that that is super valuable. Now, if you've got a patient, they're feeling like a million bucks, and you do a home study, and it's beautiful, and the physician's happy with it, okay, cool, but for anybody else, I greatly greatly encourage you to get that person in the sleep lab and make sure that's working. A uh, question that was put up, uh, posted here, um, this is from Mark. He says, uh, thanks, Jameson. I agree with you 100%. I've had a lot of my TMJ patients I've referred for sleep apnea treatment, and the TMJ problems have gone away. Isn't that interesting? These patients are getting lost in the shuffle, and we need to get the word out to them. Great work. Hey, thank you very much, Mark. You know, I'm a TMJ guy. Uh, I came into this from the TMD field. This has completely changed my paradigm. Uh, I have gotten more and more conservative with my TMJ treatment over the years, and now I am so blessed to live in a time where I believe we are getting to the source etiology of a lot of these people. But here's our job, guys and gals that are on the phone. There are people every day being misdiagnosed. There are people being misdiagnosed with depression, misdiagnosed with GERD, misdiagnosed with ADHD in kids, misdiagnosed with all these things that we can help as dentists. I believe that this is going to be the next new wave of prevention amongst in dentistry. We're going to be preventing sleep apnea in little kids. We're going to be preventing the middle-aged guy from 
going from mild to moderate and moderate to severe and getting diabetes and getting all sorts of other problems. We as dentists look at the airway more than any physician on earth. And it's time for us to step up and help these people. So, hey, thanks again, uh, Rose, for, for having me on tonight. I've really enjoyed it and hope some people got something out of it. Well, Jameson, that was just such a, a great uh, session. Thank you so much. Very motivating. I'm going to go post on my Facebook all of that about the misdiagnosis <laughs> right away. So thank Final you again. On that point, Rose, um, if you go to my website, that's jamesonspencer.com, I've got a little blog there, and there's, uh, there's a couple articles, one on uh, what I call secondhand sleep apnea, which is this of uh, someone sleeping next to someone with snoring and sleep apnea, and another one on ADHD. If anybody wants to read those, those are lay people articles. That is something kind of fun to post on your Facebook. Again, that's just my name, jamesonspencer.com, and you can look at those articles, sh share those with your friends, and maybe we can uh, help some people get correctly diagnosed. I'll be posting one on, on depression here soon. Thank you so much again, that was awesome. Yes, thank you, Dr. Spencer. And thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we'll see you all next week for the uh, Tuesday evening webinar. And again, thanks so much, Dr. Spencer. We really enjoyed having you. My pleasure. All right, thank you everybody for attending. We'll see you next week. All right, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, Dr. Good night. Glass. Good night, Rose. <laughs>